I tell you what, anybody grateful that we get to worship together today? I tell you what, I'm sorry, but I got to do it twice, so... I don't know where you all were, but uh, we, it's such a blessing to, to be able to gather in this place and not, listen, we're not just singing songs. Anybody here just to sing some songs? You can do that anywhere. We gather together to lift up the name of Jesus together. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's when it gets good right there. So I'm so glad you guys are here today. It is a blessing to be with you, and I'm looking forward to a brand new series with you today. Uh, Before we jump into that, I got to ask you a question. Does anybody have any idea what the longest book in the Bible by word count is? Any thoughts? Throw them out there. I I hear, and cherries. What? No, that's not a book. Uh, <laughs> dictionary. Okay, I guess I, I got close. <laughs> so it is not Psalms. Next best guess. It's not Jude. Um, Jeremiah is the longest book in the Bible by word count. The second longest is Genesis, right. Uh, it is actually more words than the book of Psalms. Coming in third place, hint, you know the answer, is what? There you go. It's Psalms. Psalms is the third longest by word count. However, if you count the number of chapters, the book with the most chapters is everybody. Psalms. Okay, yes. Okay, so Psalms is the longest book by chapter. And now 150 chapters, each chapter a different poem that was written to be sung. They're songs. They're poems that are there to be sung. That's what is in Psalms. And when we look into the book of Psalms, what we find is that those different poems address different things. They're not all about the same thing. You have, as you might be familiar with, if you have any experience with the Psalms, that some of them are about praise. Some are about devotion and and gratitude. There's some about triumph. There's these victorious ones. And then there's Psalms about sorrow about dependency and, and desperation and fear and, and trying to trust. And, and there's good moments that we find in the Psalms and there are dark moments that we find. And there's moments all in between found in the Psalms. And the thing that I personally love about the Psalms is that they are so real and the emotion is raw. They're they're not cleaned up nice and neat. Let's just write what sounds right. They don't write what sounds right. They write what's real. And so when you read the Psalms, what you get is something very relatable. You open Psalms, you read a little while, you go, this is me. I felt like this. I have screamed at heaven and said, where are you, God? Just like David in Psalm 13. And there's been moments where I just felt so much gratitude, I don't want to say thank you, just, just like Psalm 100. Like, I, I would start to see my experience captured in the Psalms. It's an incredible, incredible, powerful collection inspired by the, the Holy Spirit to help direct and lead us. And so what we're doing when we come to this series that we're starting today, by the way, it is entitled, what, everybody help me out? Unstuck. I think we may have made that word up, but that's okay. We'll we'll still use it. Uh, Loosening the grip of emotional chaos. What we're doing is we're looking into four different psalms today in the next three weeks. And in those psalms, looking for guidance, direction in how to deal with emotions that sometimes we get stuck in. These emotional places we get stuck in. And, And as we, we look into them, we're going to gain some instruction in dealing with different emotional things, places we get stuck, like uh, the stuck place of bitterness, um, the stuck place of blah. Anybody ever been there? Yeah, I don't even know what to call that. It's just M-E-H, meh. Like, that's my life right now. Like, that stuck place that we can get to, uh, stuck in overwhelm, stuck in fear. We're going to look at some of these things together, looking into the Psalms to discover what they teach us about dealing with these different things. Now, the point of doing this, you might think, hearing that, okay, so we get in stuck places, it doesn't feel good, we're going to go to the Bible so that we can learn some things, so we can get out of them and feel good. That's the point. That. It was nice. We're probably going to walk out of here with, hopefully, feeling a little bit different. That's great, but that's not the point. 
That's not the goal. You see, God has a bigger plan for your life than let me make you feel better. There's a much larger, much grander purpose for your existence than let's make you feel better today. Oh, if we could get a hold of that truth. Wow. The truth is this. God's desire for you is to turn from your sin with his help and turn to Jesus and put your faith in Jesus. And in so doing, let him come into your life and turn your life around to forgive your sin, to make you new so that you can live a quantitative and qualitatively different kind of life. A life that is about living his way for his glory, for his purposes. Something much bigger than you or me. He wants you to to live his way as a disciple of Jesus. More and more looking and living like Jesus, thinking and believing like Jesus, being like Jesus, and helping other people to come into a relationship with Jesus and to begin to look and live like him as well. It's why we're here as a church. It's often said this way. We exist to make, maybe you can help me out, more and better disciples. That's what we're here to be about. And here's the thing. When you and I get into an emotional stuck place, you know what happens in those moments? When we get in this emotional stuck place is our hope is robbed from us. Our energy is, is, is redirected. Our attention is stolen and it tends to make our lives all about me. And when my world shrinks to the size of me, I stop pursuing following Jesus. I stop trying to help other people follow Jesus. I stop the plan and the mission of God in my life because I'm stuck in this emotional place. So if we can loosen the grip of these emotional stuck places, we not only will feel better, but beyond that, we will be able to begin to maybe press back into the reason for why we're breathing, the purposes of God for our lives. That's what this is about, helping us get unstuck so that we may live to the glory of God with his power at work in our lives. And so uh, as we we press into these things, um, there are some of the things that we're going to talk about that are going to be hard, they're going to be heavy, and some some of us are going to be dealing with some real things. And that's good. That's gonna be good for us. We need to go there and deal with these things. And maybe today you're gonna say, you know what, I'm not dealing with that. Everything that we're gonna talk about over the next couple weeks, including today, you've either been there or you're going there, even if you're not there right now. So all of this is very relevant for every one of us. This past week, I came across some statistics. And the first one is this, that 58% of adults in the United States claimed that they were lonely. 58%, well over half of the adults in this country said, I'm lonely. What's what's painful is that same concept for 18 to 24 year olds. The statistic rose to 79% of 18 to 24 year olds say, I'm lonely, I'm lonely. Loneliness is growing and becoming more and more of an epidemic in our culture today. It is a very real thing. And if you uh, say today, I don't feel lonely, you're in a very small percentage today that would say, I don't have any sense of loneliness in my life at all. Loneliness being this disconnected feeling, this isolated feeling, this alone feeling. And this feeling uh, is that we are by ourselves. And sometimes when we are by ourselves and we feel alone, what we really are craving and really want is just more bodies around us. We just need people around us and that would solve my aloneness. But sometimes, as you know, you can be in a crowd and still feel alone. Anybody aware of that? Maybe today that's where you are. You're in this room and you're like, I'm surrounded by people, but I feel so alone still. So maybe, maybe this aloneness is about people around me, and maybe it's about something more. There's other things that, that, that this feeling is. This, this feeling comes from this idea of being unknown. 
When you and I um, feel like no one really gets me, you know, they say they do, they kind of, but they don't really get me. Or uh, no one knows what I'm feeling right now. Nobody understands my situation and what it's like and what I'm going through. When you have those feelings, you feel alone. You feel lonely when nobody gets you and understands where you're coming from, when you're unknown. And when you feel unwanted, when the people around you don't really care with any real genuine compassion about what you're struggling with. They're just like, oh, that's really too bad. And no one really, really cares. You feel alone. It's all you. And when you feel like no one is willing to help you, you've got something to, that needs done or something needs taken care of, and you're like, where, where is everybody? I'm all by myself trying to do this. I feel so alone. And when... The people around you, they, they don't make you feel valuable to them. You feel unloved and completely alone. Even in a crowd, if you, you feel unknown or unwanted or unhelped or unloved, you feel alone. There's so many different things that can contribute to the feeling of being lonely. And these feelings are heavy and living under the weight of them is painful. But I want to make sure there's two ways that we could potentially respond to those feelings that we just need to take off the table right now. Number one is blaming everyone else. If they would just, if they did, why don't they ever, I'm just here and nobody does, that's why I'm so alone. And I'm going to stay here until they fix it. That is a horrible place to live. To wait here until everyone around me just notices and picks up the ball and, and just carries it and makes it all right for me. That is not a healthy place to be. If that's where you are today and you're just folding your arms and you're just holding a grudge because nobody's making you feel, don't stay there. That is not okay. That's not a good place to be today. And the second thing is this, to say, I feel by myself in some areas of my life right now. I'm a little lonely in some areas. And you know what? It's okay. I'll just deal with it. It'll pass. It'll be fine. I'll just ignore it. That's not okay either. Ignoring it is not a solution. Making others responsible so that, that, that you're waiting for them and ignoring it, those are two things that we just cannot do. We need to address the need that we have. And today, what I want to let you know is this, that we are not going to address every underlying reason for why you are experiencing those feelings of aloneness. We're not going to be able to, to address every single one of those. That's not the goal. And we're not going to attempt to supply every aspect of help that you might need you may need some professional assistance to help you through some of the things that contribute to your loneliness. We're not going to try today to alleviate all of it. That's not our goal. What we are going to do is we're going to turn to Psalm 16, and we're going to find some truth in Psalm 16 that can loosen the grip of loneliness in our lives if we take it to heart, if we apply what it says. And so with that, I want to turn to Psalm 16 with you. Now, Psalm 16 was written, uh, as I said before, as a poem to be sung, and it was written, this one in particular, by King David. And that's David of David and Goliath fame, same guy. He writes this psalm. In the first verse, he says this, preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. David says that God is his refuge, his shelter, his hiding place, his place of safety, is God. What's really interesting in that is what he doesn't say. See, he doesn't say, preserve me, O God, by creating a refuge for me to go into. Preserve me, O God, by creating a shelter and a safe place that I could go into. He says, God, you are my refuge. God doesn't make a refuge for David. He is David's refuge. And this is huge. It's just so helpful when it comes to the concept and the emotional state of loneliness. You see, David seeks and finds shelter in his interaction with God. 
in his interaction with God, not in, in God changing his circumstances, but in an interaction with God, Dave, David finds this refuge. And in order to be able to find this refuge in God, there's two things that have to be true. Number one, God has to be present. If God's not there, he can't find a refuge in him. So God has to be present. And the second thing is this, that God has to be available for him to take refuge. And so we find here right out of the gate in the Psalm is that God is both present and available. He is present in Hebrews chapter 13, verse five. He has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, amen? He is present. And in Psalm 139, verse seven, where shall I go from your, your spirit? Or where, where shall I flee from your presence? The answer is, I can't. I can't flee from your presence because you are always here. When you take the fact that God is always present and he is always available, you have something incredibly powerful. When I was in high school, I had a friend that loved to sing all the time. You know anybody like that, Pastor Trey? Um, <laughs> I, love, I love when Pastor Trey sings because it's all the time, but it's awesome. He's very good. Uh, but I had this guy that, that, that's a friend that would sing and uh, he would just start going, la, 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 blah, blah. It was better than that. But he'd la, 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 la. And I'd be like, hey, are you ready to go? We're ready to go. And he'd just look back at me and go, nah, and he'd keep singing. And you're like, are you ready to go? And he's like, da, 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 da. And you're like, and he would have to finish the verse or the chorus he was on before he would talk to you. And he was like, it, it was so, I was so irritated. Like, I'm asking you a question, man. Quit singing at me. Just answer the question. Sometimes I'm like, oh, that's a long song. I'm just going without you. Like, this is too, you're going to take too long. Uh, he was present, but he was not available. He was right there, but he was not available at all. And in today's day and age, there are people all around us that are present and unavailable. Why? Because of the little magic box in their hands, right? Right? I am right here, and you say, hey, uh, ask me a question. Yeah, just a second, I have to finish my, my snap here. I, I, gotta, I gotta finish my text. I gotta watch this video. I've gotta play this game, and I, I, I have so much to do right here. I am not available for you right now. Although I am right here, I am not available. The incredible news is that God is both present and available. He is not gonna sing, and you can't get his attention. And he's not going to have a phone where he is not going to respond to you. God is completely and totally available all of the time. That's good news. God is present and God is available. And here's the thing. It doesn't depend on how you feel. Well, I just don't feel like God is, is there. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change God. You see, here, here's a very, very, very important truth that we've just got to get a hold on that our emotions do not teach us truth. Do we understand this? How I feel doesn't determine what's real. Truth comes first, and the response that I have to what I believe is true is my emotion. This is really, really important. When it comes to God, we go, oh, I don't feel him. That means that this must be true about God. Your feelings do not change the reality of who God is or what God is doing. He is and does, and our response to what we believe is true is our emotional state. The truth is that God is always present, always available. And we'll say it this way. Despite our feelings sometimes, we are never alone. You are not alone, ever. God is present and available for you and for me. So, so what if, like David, instead of seeking God to be the giver, like here's my basket, hey God, when I interact with you, I just need more stuff. Can you just throw stuff my way? Can you help me with this? Can you fix that? Can you give me this? Can you do this? And I'm just holding out my bucket of blessings and just fill this up, God. What if instead of looking to God to be the giver, we actually stopped and looked to God to be the gift? What if God was the gift that we really needed? What if we didn't look to God to be a means to our end, but he was the end? In seeking God, it's in, in seeing him as the end that begins to loosen the grip of our loneliness. He is present. He is available. In verse two, look what it says. I say to the Lord, 
You are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. No good apart from God, David says. Therefore, goodness is found in connection with God. If there's good, but it's not found apart from God, then it has to be with God and connected to him. Connection with God is where goodness is found. This, listen, must shape our approach to our interaction with God. It must shape our approach to our interaction with God. That our pursuit of goodness in life, maybe I can find some goodness here, some goodness there, maybe that would be a benefit, that would be enjoyable. All of this needs to be redirected first and foremost to God because goodness is found in connection with God. That's a shift potentially for some of our thinking from a day-to-day perspective. And this, this shift of interaction with God may be, may be a new thought for some of us. See, our, our interaction with God up until this point may have been genuine like and, and praise and, and thanks to God. It may be a lot of complaining, God, why don't you and why aren't you and when are you showing up? And, and, it, and it may be just this... Um, sense of duty where, God, I'm going to do what you say so that you're happy with me. You get off my back and I I do your thing and our interaction is just kind of business-like. I'll do your thing and you'll be like that. And what this does right here is it shifts our thinking about our interaction. From all of that, not saying that any of this is wrong or bad, but it shifts our thinking to what if our interaction is actually about enjoying God? What if it is really about finding our joy and our delight in an interaction with God? We are actually made to find joy in him, not just from him. So let me just ask you, are you enjoying God? How's that going? Are you enjoying God? Does that shift categories maybe a little bit? Wait, I... I've heard to obey him, serve him, sing to him. What do you mean enjoy him? If you have never conceived of your interaction with God to be enjoyed, I am so excited for you. I'm so excited for you because you're hearing something that can fundamentally change your relationship with God and your experience of God and ultimately your life. Let me just ask you this. What, what's the greatest gift of salvation? Is it that we're forgiven, that, that no longer carry that guilt and we are set free and blameless before God? Is that the greatest thing of salvation? Is it that we are adopted into the family of God? We become a child of the king and we're his, we belong to him. Is it that we are citizens of heaven? Like our citizenship is now changed and I... I, I I'm going to be in heaven. That's going to be my home for all eternity. That's, is, what's the greatest gift of our salvation? Jesus came to earth and gave his life to pay for our sin, but, but why? He did forgive when we put our faith in him. He did adopt when we put our faith in him. He does make us citizens of heaven, but, but what's it all about? He bought you with his blood so he could have a relationship with you that you could know him and enjoy him forever. That's what salvation is aimed towards. John Piper says it this way, the gospel is not a way to get people to heaven. It's a way to get people to God. That's the point. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and your son Jesus whom you sent. John 17, three tells us that. Salvation is all about connecting in a personal relationship with God. Jesus did everything he did in his death and his resurrection that we would have a loving, life-giving, life-changing, personal relationship of enjoying God. All throughout scripture, we are shown and directed and even commanded to enjoy God. In Habakkuk 3.18, yet I will rejoice where in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God is the focus of my joy. And then in Psalm 37, there's a command, delight yourself in the Lord. Find delight in the Lord. Philippians 4.4, rejoice where? 
in the Lord always. Again, I'll say rejoice just so that you don't forget what I said three seconds ago and really emphasize it. Rejoice in the Lord. Goodness is found in connection with God. And, and, and the, the grip of loneliness in our life is loosened when we acknowledge more, that, more than just that God is present. We are energized as we choose to delight and enjoy him. It begins to change our experience from loneliness to having connection with him. Despite our feelings, we are never alone. God is present and available. Goodness is found in connection with God. Incredible truths in just the first two verses of this psalm. As we, as we continue to verse three and four, he takes a turn uh, into a different category here. He says this, as for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. What he's saying is, that there is this great delight in the people that are pursuing God and godly living. Those who are turning to other idols, other things to find life, to try to find satisfaction. He said, and they're doing these offerings and they're, they're chasing after. He says, I'm not gonna do what you do. I'm not even gonna mention these false gods that you are chasing after. They have nothing, but I'm gonna take great delight in those who are pursuing God himself. And so here's the point. There is delight in the company of the godly. There's delight. He's like, this is good, so good that there's delight in the company of God, godly. And so here's what I would say. When possible, put yourself in the company of people who are pursuing God. When possible, put yourself in the company of people who are pursuing God. When I was in college, as a freshman, I was getting to know people and finding my way around and, and experiencing different relationships with different people and just kind of different groups and whatnot. And I found a group of people that every one of them in this group was someone that was pursuing a, a real relationship with Jesus. And it was changing them and I wanted to be around them because I wanted that to shape me. I wanted that to, to, to mold me and make me to be more like those people. As I'm trying to follow Jesus, these guys are, are showing me and helping me. I want to be around them. And it just so happened that all of them were runners. It was the cross country team. So I went out for the cross country team, not to run. I went out for the cross country team to be around the people that I knew I needed to be around if I was going to become the person I wanted to become. And looking back on it, this is what I was doing. There was delight in the company of the godly, so I went out for a sport to be around them. I got injured at the beginning of the season. I just spent a lot of time on the sidelines watching them and riding a bus, but we had a great time uh, together. Didn't really do any running, but that wasn't why I was there, so it was all good. Um, see, here's the thing. Surrounding ourselves with godly people, people that are pursuing God, makes a difference. And, and to that end, having people around you on a consistent basis is really, really important. That is the reason for why we have connect groups here at North. I want you to understand this, that connect groups are not just another program because we have nothing to do and you might like them. That's not why we have connect groups. We have connect groups because connect groups are incredibly important in shaping you and helping you to become more like Jesus as a disciple. Relationships are key in disciple making and you need godly people around you. We're putting connect groups together every year for three seasons right now, maybe even shifting to four. We'll talk about that some other time, but we've got these groups that are happening and it's in the summer, spring season is gonna be happening at the end of this month. And the point of it is so that you would find people that are pursuing Jesus around you and they would be shaping your life and you'd be shaping theirs. And it's so much more powerful than just sitting in a room and having conversation. You see, we were made for community. We need community. We grow best in community to look more like and live like Jesus. Um, I've had the privilege of being in, in a, uh, a connect group uh, over the past few seasons with the same guys. And uh, every time I go to group, I walk out with a new perspective that I didn't have going in. 
And I hear a story, an anecdote that I go, oh, wow, I hadn't thought about it that way or applying it that way, and that guy's doing that. And I walk out inspired and more ready to actively follow Jesus because I was in the room with these guys. It is incredible what happens. I, it, never have I ever walked out and went, well, that was a waste of time. Never. Because this type of thing where I am in the company of godly people always produces fruit in my life. And listen, you need it. That's why it's one of the key parts of the strategy of how we are making more and better disciples at this church is by giving you a group to be a part of for that to happen in your life. And so I would even go as far as to say this. If it is a physical possibility for you, you need to be investing yourself in a connect group. The summer season, like I said, is beginning in a few weeks, and you can sign up on our website uh, to pursue that. But I also want to let you know that sometimes uh, just a little bit more focused time and attention one-on-one when we're going through difficult emotional things is really, really helpful. And to that end, we have a ministry here known as Stephen Ministry. Now, let me just make sure you know what this is about. You'll see these brochures are on all the tables on the back uh, around the room. They're there every week. I just want to point them out to you. The idea is this, that there are people in this congregation that have gone through over 50 hours of training to be able to sit down one-on-one and just simply walk with you through the difficult season that you're facing. And it may be some really major thing that's happened in your life, and it may just be It's just a little tough season I'm going through right now with this thing, and maybe it's because I'm feeling a little lonely. And I just need someone to to connect with and just to kind of walk with me through this season. That's what this is all about. It's incredibly powerful. The people that have been through this and spent time with a Stephen minister, I've only heard people say how incredibly helpful it has been for them. And so I want to encourage you If you think, you know what, that might be helpful for me, pick one of these up on your way out. You can go to the website as well. The information is there under Stephen Ministry. Um, It's all confidential, all of that. If you go to the website, you just click the button, I'd like to talk to someone on the Stephen Ministry page. Really helpful. You see, cultivating friendships with other people that are pursuing Jesus will help to loosen the grip of aloneness. In a connect group with the Stephen Minister, I really want to encourage you. Step towards other people today. And I know, because I'm one of you, those of you that are introverts in the room and you're going, I'm good by myself. I don't need that stuff. I'm an introvert too, and I used to believe that until I experienced it and said, you know what? I need people. I realize the difference of without and with. And for those of you who are like, man, I just, that's not my thing. I don't really do that. You know what? It's because you've never really done it. You've never really experienced what God can do through that, or you wouldn't say that. So I really want to encourage you, take a step. Step into some community where there are godly people and find the truth that there is delight in the company of the godly. Now, all of that said, we need it. We're created for it. This is an opportunity that is really, really healthy and helpful for you. These two things, great opportunities. Step towards that. But I do want to say this, even still, People will never be all you need. As much as we think of aloneness as the absence of human beings around me, they will never, ever be all you need. You need them. You need people in your life, but they will not be everything you need. No one will ever truly understand the depth of the core of your being and what's really going on there. No human can get in there and get it. But we have a God who is present and available and knows you. And when you connect with him there, the grip of loneliness begins to loosen in a way that nothing else will loosen it. Everything that we've talked about so far in these verses comes down to this, that we loosen the grip of loneliness with these two things by connecting with God and cultivating friendships with godly people. These two things are absolutely essential in your life. I want to show you the end of this psalm because David continues to celebrate his confidence in God and and how those things that he celebrates continue to loosen the grip of loneliness. And, And it comes down to this, that God knows you, he provides, he instructs, and he helps. So in Psalm 16, 
Verse five through eight, look what it says. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. That is everything is in your hands, God. You're sovereign. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. He's using a land analogy of boundary lines and that this is his inheritance. Basically what he's saying is, you know exactly what I need and you provide it. You're an incredible provider. And when you know and you provide, I, I get a sense that I'm not alone. And when you realize that God knows you and he's gonna provide for you, the loneliness is loosened. And then he says, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night. Also, my heart instructs me. And that is as I reflect on the counsel of the Lord. What he's saying is that you know where I am and you know what I need to know in order to go forward. I'm stuck here. I don't understand something. I'm not sure the direction I go, but you provide that because you know me and what I need. You get me and you help me move forward. And in that, the grip of loneliness is loosened. And then he says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. The right hand, when you read that, especially like in the Psalms, is a symbol of strength. And so he says, when you're, you're at my right hand, you are my strength. You are my help. And what that means is that God not only knows you, but he knows what you need and how to help you. And he brings aid. He is your strength in your weakness. He does care about you. God cares about me. I'm not alone. When we realize like David that, that we're known, that he provides, he instructs, and he helps, and he cares, the grip of loneliness begins to loosen. And then he wraps up the psalm in verse 9 through 11 saying this, therefore my heart, listen to this, is glad, and my whole being rejoices. I don't know about you, but I like the sound of that. I sure could use a little more gladness. Anybody? How would you like for your whole being to rejoice? Does that sound good? Look what he says. My flesh will also dwell secure for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let, my holy, or let your holy one see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Because of God's presence in his life, he is glad, he rejoices now and forever. He says, there is joy in God's presence. Listen, loneliness is real and it is heavy, but it can be loosened when we realize that we have a present and available God. We have access to people that are pursuing Jesus. That you are not alone. He is, no matter how you feel, you are never alone. You are not unknown. You are not unwanted. God is available to help you in your need because he is absolutely crazy about you. Listen, when you allow those truths to begin to sink in, the grip of loneliness begins to be loosened. You become a little less stuck in that place. So connect with God and maybe in a different way this week. Cultivate friendships with godly people and let that grip be loosened. I'm gonna invite the musicians if you guys would come back up. Um, and as they come, as you hear these things, you know, you need to connect with God in a way that you're enjoying God and you need to connect with godly people and cultivate these friendships. Maybe you're saying, that's not brand new information to me. I, I know those things. I've heard those things. If that's true, that's fantastic. But the reality is that there is potential, even though we know those things, to even if it is not intentional, wander from them. It, life happens, life gets busy, we get into things and distraction and we can't do this thing, we gotta do that and we change our schedule and this happens and that and we find ourselves potentially in a place where we are now trying to satisfy our deepest longings and find good in places that can't deliver it. And we're stopping to look up where we know the answer really is. And maybe we're just starting to ask God to give us those things instead of finding it actually in him. And we need to return to that today. And, and maybe, you know, you're well aware that I need godly people in my life and everything, but it's gotten busy and I've just kind of gotten away from that. And now I'm over here and there's really no people that are close to me, around me, helping me follow Jesus. I know that. I've been there. It's just, that's not what's happening right now. And I just want to encourage you. Don't leave here today going, wow, I probably should do something about that. Because next year you'll be saying, I probably should have done something about that. Make a plan today. Don't leave without a plan. 
to connect with God and to cultivate those godly friendships. Before you leave, go, this is what I'm going to do about it. This has got to change in my life. And maybe today you would say, this is news to me. I, I didn't know you could actually have a relationship with God like that. That that's really what he wants? And I can actually find a joy that is the greatest joy I'm ever going to experience on the planet in a relationship with him? I didn't realize I was supposed to do that or I could do that. And maybe you're saying, you know what? I, I've got people around me, but not people pursuing God. And I'm not finding delight in, in cultivating friendships with godly people. And I didn't realize that was so important. And I need to do that. Or maybe you'd say, I'm so stuck in this place of loneliness. I just need someone to come and walk with me and help me in this season. And I need a Stephen minister. I want to encourage you to take a step in your relationship with God today. I want to encourage you to take a step in your relationship with people today. Because when you do, you will be in awe of how God changes your life. I've never seen anybody move in that direction and not be changed. Our God is good. He gives us his truth so that we can put it into practice and it can change us. I want to take you to prayer and I want to take you to a moment of interaction with God. He's waiting for you to engage with him, to interact with him, and to enjoy him. So would you bow your heads with me? Lord, we just want to begin by saying thank you for being present. Thank you that you are with us. And God, thank you that you are not distracted, that you are completely available right now. Thank you. We don't deserve that, but you've made a way. And it doesn't depend on how we feel. Actually, you want us to just bring our feelings to you and be honest with you. Thank you for showing us today that that good is found in you and that there is delight in the company of those who are seeking you. God, we we want those things to shift in our lives, to change us, to make us more into the people that you have created us to be, to desire us to be. And Lord, we, we want to start right now by enjoying you. So right now, as we continue to pray, just let the Lord know where you are. Maybe you just want to say, God, um, I need to learn to enjoy you. Will you help me? Maybe you need to say, God, I do enjoy you. I've just forgotten to actually dwell here and delight in you. Help me to, to come back to this. Thank you that you want this. Maybe you just need to admit and confess this to him and and, and apologize and just, sorry that I have been chasing other things. I don't want to chase them anymore. I know you're better. I know you're the greatest joy. And I want to connect with you in this way. Would you help me? The truth is that being alone in this world is so difficult. Being alone without Christ is unbearable. And God sent Jesus, his son, to live and die and rise from the dead so that you could be saved and you could have him and he could have you. So as we continue to pray, and and, and if you're in a place where you're saying, I've never I've never come to a place in my life where I've chosen to turn away from from sin and doing life my way and with your help to turn, God, to put, put my faith and trust in Jesus to save me from my sin. But today I want to turn my life over to you and I want to trust you with everything. If you're ready to turn your life over to him, then I'm going to invite you right now just to express your heart to him in a prayer. I'm going to give you these words and, and, and let these words become your words in the quietness of your heart. Would you pray these with me? Dear God, I need a savior. I can't save myself. I believe Jesus lived, that he died, and he rose from the dead to be my savior. I choose now to turn from my sin and turn to you giving you my life. 
and trusting in you alone to save me. Help me to live the rest of my life for you who gave your life for me. Lord, we say thank you. Thank you for drawing people to yourself today. Thank you for giving new life today. Thank you for changing lives today as they've placed their faith in you. You get all the glory. You get all of the credit. And Lord, as we continue to pray today, may the words of this song lead us in our conversation with you. Lord, may these words be our prayer to you now.